blessed is the man with a vision. Hallelujah. Father, we are very grateful for your word. I pray as we look at a very familiar story today, you would breathe life into it. Lord, you would give us ears to hear. And that uh, each one of us could take our next step with you, whatever that looks like. And we would know you a little bit better. Thank you for it. Amen. 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 Thinking about the, the kingdom of God, and it's lived out very differently than the kingdom of man and the kingdom of the world. If you think about it, if you want to keep what you have, the scripture says, give it away. <laughs> that's, that's a little unusual. It'll come back to you. Press down, good measure, running over. If you receive hate from someone, we're supposed to return love. We're supposed to give love back, not revile, not reacting and so forth. If somebody is screaming at you, the scripture says, lower your voice. Try that the next time you're in some kind of an argument. Just lower your voice. A soft answer turns away wrath, the scripture says. You might control that whole environment to where it doesn't get as ugly as it was. If you want to lead, take the lower place. Go down. If you want it, the way up is down in the kingdom of God. If you pray and you fast, which I hope we all do, we're not supposed to make a big public show about it. We're supposed to go into our closet and talk to our Heavenly Father who will reward us openly if we act in that way. If you want to be truly free, everybody wants freedom. Well, the way to become free is to become a slave to Christ. See, the, the kingdom is different thinking than the world's thinking. If you want victory... Glory in your weaknesses. That doesn't fly in the face of most training you will get in the world system. But when I am weak, then I'm really strong, Scripture says. And finally, if you want to live, you have to die. <laughs> so the kingdom of God is, is radically different. In fact, Jesus said these three, three different occasions. If you want to be great, become a servant. The greatest among you shall be your servant. It's not supposed to be the way with you that it is the way in the world, he's telling his disciples. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And as you think about those things, you realize that the kingdom of God is others-focused, not me-focused. It's not I-focused, it's outward-focused. In the world, we're told to take care of ourselves for no one else will. You're number one. Look out for number one. You've got to take care of it. Take care of yourself. And while there's an element of truth in that, that is not biblical thinking. The biblical thinking is, is that the way up is down. The way to self-worth is through the cross and dying to ourself, not embracing selfishness. The way to get self-esteem is to love and serve other people and not focus on ourself, not inward. We're encouraged to embrace the cross to kill selfishness, not embrace I over everyone else. We're given an example in Philippians 2 of our Lord and what he did. I'll just read it to you. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affliction and sympathy, affection, <laughs> affliction, affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you Look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Why? Well, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, or as some translations say, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross." Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and every and under earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. The Creator Himself became part of creation in order to redeem it. He was the only one who could, and I'm so grateful for that. He was worth all of his creation, therefore he could pay the price for that creation. And aren't you glad, and aren't I glad that he did? And if we can't find anything else to be thankful about, we can be thankful about that. He paid the price. And this is just an introduction by way of backdrop. What I, what I want to talk to you today about is a very familiar story. It's one of the very early miracles of Jesus. 
And it's in Luke 5. It's also in the parallels there listed. But we're going to read the run out of Luke 5. On one of those days, one of these days, as he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with him to heal. And behold, some men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed. And they were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. But finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said, Man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to question, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? When Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them, Why do you question in your hearts? Which is easier for you to say? Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise up and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And immediately he rose up before them and picked up what he had been lying on and went home glorifying God. And amazement seized them all. And they glorified God and were filled with awe, saying, we have seen extraordinary things today. I've read this healing miracle multiple times, but rarely have I slowed down to go deep into it. And I hope to do a little bit of that today. There's lots of players in the story, right? I mean, you've got the crowd, you've got Jesus, you've got the sick man, you've got his friends that are carrying him, you've got the scribes and the Pharisees. There's lots of extras in the story, and they each play a part. Jesus is teaching. We know he comes back from spending his time in prayer, and he's teaching at this house, and the place is packed. It's, it's in who knows what the house looked like, but there's a room where he's at, and then it goes on out the door and out into the street. Who knows how far it goes? But at some point in time, the four men decided they were going to take this sick guy who's paralyzed and take him to Jesus. They get together. Maybe they were servants. Maybe they were commanded to do it. Maybe they were friends. Most people feel like they were probably friends. But they make a decision that today's the day we're going to do something about this guy's condition. And we're going to take him to Jesus. Good for them. That is great. A lot of things we don't know. We don't know how long the guy was paralyzed. We don't know the severity of the paralysis. We don't know the spiritual condition of the guy. We don't know any of those things. But we do know what happens. And and it's pretty interesting. What I want to do is take a quick swipe at it. Just some initial thoughts after reading it is that Jesus deals with heart issues in this story, in, in this reality. It isn't a story, it's a, it's a historical event that took place. But he's dealing with the heart issues on both sides of it, with the Pharisees as well as with the guys that are, that are bringing the man. As far as I know, the guy didn't say anything, neither did his friends say anything. It was simply something they did. And Jesus speaks directly to their hearts based on their actions, not their words. The men risked rejection, social rejection. They, they, they risked their reputations by going there. The Jewish culture, particularly the scribes and the Pharisees, taught that sickness was a result of sin. Therefore, if you are sick, you're a sinner. You remember when Jesus is, is with his disciples and they come upon a guy who's born blind and the disciples ask the question that everybody wants to know, who sinned? Was it him or his parents? And Jesus gives them a third answer that they hadn't even considered, which was neither one. It was just for the glory of God that I can do this miracle. And they're going, huh? So these guys risk their reputation by hanging out with this guy and taking him. The crowd wouldn't make room for him. Can you imagine the, the scene? They're, they got this guy and they're trying to bring him and they're elbowing and trying to get through. And maybe there's one of the guys who's pretty aggressive. He's, let me get through this crowd. And he starts pushing and shoving people around or whatever. Come on, make room. Sick guy here. Sick guy. Come on, make room. And nobody moves. Hey, get back in line. If you wanted to be here early, you should have been here early. This is my spot. You're not getting through here. Maybe they were sick and needed to get in, wanted to get in. Or maybe there wasn't anywhere to go. But it became pretty obvious that they were not going to get through the crowd. The crowd wasn't going to let them through. So they had to come up with something else. And it speaks to me of friends being determined no matter what the obstacles are. You'll be blessed if you have such friends. But it doesn't matter the resistance, they're going to get this guy to the Lord. So I naturally go to administrative type questions. What this roof thing? They, how did it get up there? Now they, they argue about it. I mean, it's amazing how much is written about what we don't know. And, you know, all the elaborate stories that they come up with of doing this, but apparently there's a back staircase or something that these guys can get up on the roof. 
ladder laying around. I don't know. I don't know how they got up there. How did they lower the guy down? How long were the ropes? Did they bring extra tackle? Did they bring equipment with it? Was it laying around up there? Just say, hey, in case you want to dig through the roof, here's some ropes to lower this guy down. What was the roof made out of? How big of a mess was it? How big of a hole was it that they put this guy through? What was going on underneath when this was happening? Because it says they lower him right in front of Jesus. So was Jesus sitting there going, you know, dusting off his shoulder, dirt, uh, step back? What was going on with all of this? Who cleaned up the mess afterwards? See, nobody ever thinks about that. Nobody ever thinks about it. Somebody's got to put that roof back together and sweep this place up. Whatever it was, and it uses the word tile, which means it's more than grass being taken back. It probably was a substantial roof. These guys dug through it. These guys made a mess for the sake of their friend. <laughs> I like that. One of those days, the scripture says, the scribes and the Pharisees had come. Teachers of the law were sitting there. because This came from all the villages. This is, this is one of the very early miracles of Jesus. They're trying to figure out who this guy is. And so they're gathered together. They're listening to what he has to say. They're listening to his teaching. And then this starts happening. And the power of the Lord was there to heal. And people argue about what that means and so forth. And maybe it was the Holy Spirit. Maybe it was to heal the Pharisees. I don't know. You can read a lot of different things into it. But the Lord was going to heal that day. And some men, unknown men, bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed, and they were seeking to bring him to Jesus. I like that. Maybe you feel like you're an unknown man or an unknown woman, and you have no purpose or no goal or no outward effect on anybody or anything. These guys are simply carrying this guy, carrying their friend to the Lord. Anyway, that'll, that'll preach. I wonder what Jesus was thinking. They couldn't find a way to bring him in because of the crowd, so they went up on the roof, we know this, and they let him down through the tiles, and I often wonder, what was the expression on Jesus' face? Like I said, he's teaching, is he upset? That, hey, who's, what, you know, dust in here, dude? I mean, I'm trying to get this message going here, and it, it's falling down. You know he's watching the crowd. I mean, in the early days of this church, we were meeting in a, in a gym, basically, and there I'm preaching eloquently, you know, whatever I'm doing. And I'm watching everybody in the congregation, and they're all doing this. I mean, they're all looking up constantly through the message. And I'm going, what, what are you all looking at? Well, there was this red balloon that, that was up on the ceiling, and it had come, and it, and it came down, like, right behind me. So you, you can imagine everybody in this room, as the ceiling's being taken out, it would have been fairly obvious that something isn't normal here. What was Jesus' face? What, what was, it? was it a smirk? Was he smiling? Was he upset? Was he, you know, what was he doing? I, I get curious about those kind of things. I think we get a little bit of insight. It says, when he saw their faith, he said, man, your sins are forgiven you. He saw the faith that it took for these guys who said, we are not going to be stopped. We are getting this guy in front of Jesus today. I don't care if we have to take the roof off. We're going to get him in front of the Lord because he needs to be healed and this guy can do it and we're coming and we're going to do it. And he sees their faith. He sees their faith. They didn't say anything. It's not recorded that they said anything. But he saw something in their actions that spoke. And Luke says man. If you read it in Matthew and Mark, he says son, take heart. Your sins are forgiven. Man here can mean all men. It can mean one man. It can be a family type term. And that's kind of what I'm thinking it is. Is that he saw their faith and he says, Son, take courage. I'm going to heal you. And I'm going to heal you where you really need to be healed first. And that's in your sins. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. Some other thoughts as I stopped and thought more about this. As Jesus goes to the root first eternal problem. The man needed to be healed of his sins. I don't know if he was a believer or not a believer. I'm assuming he wasn't at that point. But he says, your sins are forgiven. I'm sure the guy's laying there and going, I can't move. I'm paralyzed. I have no life. And you're telling me my sins are forgiven? I don't care. I want to be healed. That's the way I was when the gospel was first presented. I don't care. What's that got to do with my life? 
But Jesus goes to the root of it, and he says, I'm going to deal with the eternal problem. Your sins are forgiven. The man didn't move. He didn't speak, as far as I know. He didn't jump up at that point. He's still laying there. How much time passed? I don't know. How long did the discussion take? You know the Pharisees are sitting there looking at each other going, what's this guy? Did you do? This guy just said he's going to forgive it. What does this guy think he is? And it was, you know, the buzz starts going in the room. How long did it take? He says, because of their faith, your sins are forgiven. Does that speak to something that we on the outside of someone else may have a role of some sort? Perhaps intercession for them? Perhaps service for them? Perhaps trying to, you know, talk to a tree about the Lord? Maybe not a tree, but people as hard as a tree. Say, so you need Jesus. Do we have a role in that somewhere? Most of us in here came to meet the Lord because somebody spoke to us. Somebody modeled for us. Somebody got in our face over our lack of knowing the Lord. Somebody loved us enough to share the good news with us. Maybe it was a sermon you heard. Maybe it was your parents. Maybe it was somebody, grandparents, that, that modeled walking with the Lord. These guys got their friend in front of Jesus. I like that. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to question, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? You know, they're half right. You know that, right? What they're saying isn't necessarily wrong. Here's this preacher, itinerant carpenter preacher, sitting in a house. They just drop this sinner down in front of them. This guy is obviously a sinner. And this bigger sinner blasphemes, saying your sins are forgiven. Who does he think he is? Only God can do that. Yeah, that's true. That is quite true. Man cannot forgive sins. I grew up in a denomination where if you had sinned, you would go to this little room closet thing and the guy would open the door and you'd tell him what you sinned and then he would give you absolution and say, okay, go do this and that and your sins are forgiven. You know what that is? That's heresy. <laughs> that is blasphemy. The man did not have the power to forgive sins. You go to a pastor, he does not have the power to forgive your sins. I'm sorry. There's only one way you get your sins forgiven. That's through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. We present the gospel. We are not the gospel. We present it to people. Your, your problem is your sin. The problem is you're dead in your sins. The problem is you're heading to hell without Christ. I can't do a thing about that, but I can take you and put you before Jesus. I can point you to the man that can do something about it through his cross. And we are ambassadors for that message to people. We bring them to Jesus. Jesus is the one who does the saving. But these guys are saying, who is this who speaks blasphemes? He's, he's blaspheming. He is, he is saying things that aren't true unless he's God, <laughs> which I find very interesting. Jesus knew their hearts. He says when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them, why do you question in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise and walk? Apparently the man's still laying there. They're having this debate going on. They're talking about it. I don't know how long this guy was unable to move. What a ride he must have had being carried along and dragged up on a roof and lowered down through the hole. And he's laying there. He knows Jesus sees him, right? I mean, he's looking eyeball, eyeball to eyeball at Jesus. And they start having this argument about sin, and he's going, I, 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 what's going to happen? We know what happens, because we've read the story a million times. He didn't. He's laying there going, well, if this guy isn't God, then what's going to happen? If he is, this is weird. He didn't know what was going to happen. Are, are the religious rulers, who are the ones that are used to doing everything and saying everything, and their word is law, and they direct, and they guide the synagogues, and they do all this stuff, they're saying this shouldn't be happening. Is that what's going to happen? Did we go through all of this, and I'm still going to get carried out of here? Or is something else going to happen? And Jesus says, guys, which one's easier to say? Well, anybody can say, you're healed. But that doesn't mean they're healed. Unless it's backed up with action, 
Anybody could say, your sins are forgiven. I was told that as a young man. Go do these and your sins are forgiven. You know what? My sins were not forgiven. Right. <laughs> he said it, but it wasn't true. Because there's only one who can forgive sins, and that's God. There's only one that can, can take us and re make us reborn, and that's God through the power of Jesus Christ and the cross. That's it. That's period. Yeah. He says, so which one's easier to say? Hmm. Well, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. Hmm. Man, what a thought. C can you imagine, and I would encourage you to do so, the look on the Pharisees and scribes' faces when Jesus said that? However long it took for him to say that and for the man to actually get up and walk, like I said, you have a sinner, clearly a sinner. He's paralyzed. Obviously, he's under the judgment of God. And now this blasphemer has just said something that, that's worse than the paralyzed guy. And they're waiting for lightning to hit. They're looking for rocks to pick up and stone this guy. He's in the synagogue. He's, he's teaching. He's not in the synagogue, but he's, he's teaching this stuff. We need to kill him because of what he just said. And Jesus said, but that you may know, that you may know, I say to you, rise up and walk. Wow. I'd love to see their faces. <laughs> see, one of the reasons Jesus was always in conflict with these guys, and really, as far as I can tell, this is probably the earliest miracle that started the war that went on for the next two or three years of Jesus' life between the religious people, the Pharisees, the scribes, and himself. Up until that point, they're listening to him. They're trying to figure out who he is. And at this point, he blasphemes in their mind and crosses the line. He deserves to die at this point. And yet, they're not necessarily upset that God healed the man. They're upset that Jesus claimed to be God. <laughs> See the difference? They, they would spend the next two or three years, you read through the gospel, attacking Jesus nonstop over who do you claim to be? Ah, uh, I've already told you who I am. I have shown you who I am. I'm God. And that's what they would end up handing him over to Pilate for. Their response to the gospel that Jesus was presenting was rejection, hatred, and murder, ultimately, through wicked Pilate. So, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And immediately he rose up before them, picked up what he had been lying on, and went home glorifying God. <laughs> this is what's called a miracle. Yeah. The man is paralyzed. If he's been paralyzed any length of time at all, then his muscles aren't working, then his body isn't doing what it should be doing. He's not able, I mean, you get to my age, you lay around too long and things hurt when you get up, right? I mean, you get up and your knees are cracking, your back's cracking, you've got to wait till the blood gets to your hips so you can move. You know, it, just, it gets to be that way as, as you get older. This guy's paralyzed, and it says immediately he stands up. I, again, I think of the crowd, I think of the Pharisees, I think of what, what's on Jesus' face there? What's on the four friends' face sitting up in the hole in the attic? I tried to find a good picture. All you could find were legs sticking down. It just didn't do it. <laughs> But what was on their face? Yes! 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 We got him here. And he's standing up, picking up his mat, and he's walking out. Oh, man, that is, that's just good. I like that. I like that a lot. And it's interesting now that the crowd makes room. I don't think he crawled back up through the hole in the roof. I think the crowd parted. <laughs> As he said, that guy who just healed me told me to pick up my mat. I got it, and I'm heading home. Can you imagine when he got home? What it was like. And again, Spurgeon and guys like that write all these you know, eloquent papers about when he got home and his family did this, that, and the other. I'm sure they did. I mean, who knows? It's good to think about. I bet it was a hoot. I bet the guy just rejoiced all the way home and he was telling everybody and shouting praises to God. And of course, we know what the crowd did. Amazement seized them all. And they glorified God. And they were filled with awe saying, we have seen extraordinary things yeah. today. What was Jesus' face, what, what, the expression on his face when the man stood up and was healed? Did he look at the Pharisees? Did he look at the scribes? Did he look at the crowd? 
Did he glance back up at the friends? What, what, what did he do? I mean, I'm just curious about those kind of things. There's other times when Jesus had this look of anger over sin, death, hardness of heart. Here's kind of the initial confrontation with the Pharisees and the scribes. He says, you guys, you're hypocrites. You take the place of standing and saying you speak for God, but you're a liar, a cheat, a snake, a viper. I mean, he had some harsh, harsh words for these guys. And when he says, so you guys will know that I have power on earth to forgive sins, rise up and walk, did he look at them and say, what do you think now? <laughs> I mean, I filtered, obviously, through my sinful behavior. Where I'd go, take that! You know? <laughs> you think you're something? Ha! Rise up and walk! I don't, I don't think Jesus did that. But there had to be some kind of look on his face. I'm thinking a little bit of anger. It's a conjecture, who knows. Let me ask you some questions as you think about this. Again, everybody's read this story, I'm sure. It's in three times in the Gospels, so we run into this all the time. But why would I pick a title like anonymously famous? I can't even say it, but why pick something like that? You ever think about the four guys? Who are these guys? What are their names? We don't know. Who were they? We don't know. But everybody knows them. Everybody knows about the four guys who lowered them down through the ceiling. Don't, don't you? I mean, if you've been around a believer at any length of time at all, you've read through the Gospels, you know these four guys. Who are they? And does it matter who they are? I mean, it did in their world, but does it matter? It doesn't matter to the story. Christ gets the credit. The guy gets healed. But without those four guys, that guy never would have got healed. How many times do you and I feel like we're anonymous? We're, we're behind the scenes sometimes, and, and we're doing things, and nobody knows. Is there anything wrong with that? These guys are famous, aren't they? Do you think in heaven there, there's a famous place for these guys? I mean, of all the things that Jesus did, where John says we could fill the entire world with his books, these guys get three mentions in the scripture. Though we don't know who they are, we don't know their names, we know nothing about them. And yet they are absolutely critical to the story. And you know the truth is, we all are like these guys. We're absolutely critical to a story that we don't know the ending to yet. We don't understand the role we play. We don't see all of the parts. We don't see all the ramifications of it. Maybe we're just somebody carrying a rope. <laughs> Maybe we're somebody digging through the ceiling. Maybe one of the guys was naturally destructive. Get out of the way. I'll get, a, I'll get him through this ceiling. You know, maybe you're good at tearing stuff up. And I have no purpose for the kingdom. You never know. <laughs> Maybe they stayed and cleaned up afterwards. Yeah, you don't know. We don't know. But they all played a part. And they're famous. It's just they're anonymous. And many of our lives are like that. Would we risk social rejection for somebody? You know, everybody's so concerned about their social media footprint and how many likes they get and how favorable this, that, and the other is or whatever. And yet, these guys, they were associating with a known sinner. I mean, the guy had to be a sinner. He was paralyzed. He was under the judgment of God. Their theology is off, but that is what they believed. And by hanging out with him, by doing what they did, they could have lost friendships. There could have been guys who said, I cannot believe how rude you were. You know how if you don't know how people are, give it a few years. You'll find out. Even in a miracle like that, there's going to be criticism and second guessing and judgment that goes on. I mean, the arrogance that you, how dare you interrupt Jesus? You got to say it right. You got dirt on his shoulder. Okay, the guy got healed. Yeah, but there was another way to do this, you know, the right way. That kind of stuff happens. But would we risk social rejection for somebody else? Would we dare interact with somebody that would taint our reputation, our view, someone's opinion of us? Would we cross the street? Would we go out of our way to talk to somebody who isn't cool? whatever the word is today. I don't even know what the word is. 
Would we do that? These guys did. It's just a thought in our life. Is there somebody that the Lord has in our life that he wants us to interact with regardless of what people may think or say? Just something to think about. How determined are we? I marvel at these four men. These guys did not take no for an answer. They did not take the crowd as a hindrance to what they were going to do. They were on a mission, and they were going to accomplish it. <laughs> it's a steadfast, holy stubbornness. <laughs> we are getting this guy in front of the Lord today. Today is the day. He's going. But the crowd, I don't care. They won't move. I don't care. We are getting this guy to Jesus. Well, how do you propose to do that? I know. Let's go on the roof and rip it off. And put a three-foot, six-foot, nine-foot hole on it to drop this guy down in front of him. Okay, let's go do that. <laughs> Imagine the mindset of these guys. And yet, they did it. You are blessed if you've got friends like that. Would we be that way in our determination for friends, spouse, siblings, children, people, others? Would we fight and do whatever it takes... Will we give up? There are people that I've been praying for for 40 years that still haven't come to the Lord. Do we quit? Do we give up? Do we just abandon it? Do we fight for people? Not against them, but for them. Do we overcome obstacles? These are good questions to think about. I'm so grateful that these four guys that we don't know didn't quit. We wouldn't have a story. I mean, it just wouldn't have made it in. Well, they got to the back of the crowd and they wouldn't let them in, so they all went home. Wouldn't be the same story, would it? I mean, it could be a story on giving up, I guess. But they pressed on and they overcame. Will we? Has our primary need of sin been dealt with? <laughs> the guy was paralyzed. The friends brought him because he was paralyzed, he was sick. He couldn't move. He couldn't function. His life was over. Again, they, they write a lot of stuff about it saying this was the last stages of his life as he was dying from this particular disease. Maybe, maybe not. Who knows? But his life was bleak, to put it mildly. And Jesus doesn't say to him, be healed initially. He says, your sins are forgiven. And he put things in the right priority. Where are you today? Where am I today? Do we know the Lord? Have my sins been forgiven? Have your sins been forgiven? Have you been to the cross? Have you been in front of the Savior? Said, here I am, I'm a sinner, forgive me. Please, wash me clean. He says, I love you. Your sins are forgiven. I will forgive you. How's our faith? It's interesting to me that he says, when he, when he saw their faith, the guy got what he came for and more it wasn't the guy's faith as far as I know the guy never said anything none of them even asked anything they drop him down in front of him and it's apparently it's he's just hanging there or maybe he's on the ground I don't know it depends on how long the ropes were nobody said anything or at least it's not recorded in any of the three places and yet Jesus saw their faith so what does that mean does that mean our faith can be seen <laughs> by how we actually live, by how we actually act, by how we actually walk out our lives? I think so. So how's your faith? How's my faith? I'd leave you with those five points to think about. Father, I'm thankful that you sent your son to deal with sin, ultimately, totally, completely, that we can be dead in our sins and trespasses one moment and immediately as we call out to you and we can be raised to a new life. Thank you for that, that we can be born again. You could say our sins are forgiven yeah. totally and completely. If we're in here today, if somebody's in here today and they don't know you, I pray they would run to yeah. you. Yeah. Like we sang today, I'm running to your arms. May that be a reality for somebody today. If one of your children in here has wandered and fallen away, chosen to walk away, God, I pray that they would run to you and find your loving embrace again. Find forgiveness. 
a new purpose in their life. God, I thank you for your word. No matter how many times we read it, there's always so much depth, so much truth. God, may you give us ears to hear and eyes to see and a mind to understand what you'd like to say to us as a result of being in your word today. God, may something penetrate our hearts and our minds. And God, I thank you that you came, that we could know you. So grateful that Jesus emptied himself. He humbled himself to come and walk as a man and then challenged us to abide in him, remain in him for the rest of our days here. Lord, I, I thank you for that. And it's all because you love us. So very, very grateful. So Lord, take all this today, the worship, the prayer, the message. May it produce fruit that remains, life in each one of us, for your glory and your kingdom. And I give you praise, Father. Amen.